and today I will be talking about sums of Klosterman sums and Salia sums and their applications to various things including moments of L functions. So let me start with basic definitions. Uh, in particular I want to define the sums and here you can see this uh, definition. So the Klosterman sums which I call K sub QMN, you see three parameters. There's the sums over X running through all reduced residue system modulo Q and we sum up these exponential functions. So E sub Q means uh, the exponential functions uh, of the argument divided by Q and X minus one is always understood to be computed modulo Q and Q is a subscript here. Uh, Salia sums define it almost in an identical way except that these sums are twisted by the Jacobi symbol. And this automatically means then Q must be an odd integer. So Salia sums look slightly more complicated, but uh, because of some uh, kind of reasons, I will explain it a little later. In fact, usually Salia sums are easier to handle. It's because we have no idea how to evaluate Klosterman sums. But Salia sums can be evaluated in an almost explicit way. Okay, now I want to abandon uh, Klosterman sums and Salia sums and just some motivation to talk of, uh, a little bit about Möbius function. And for, uh, for the Möbius function, which I denote mu of k as usual, uh, there was something which was uh, known uh, as Möbius pseudo randomness which in a very vague way says that for any reasonable sequence of complex numbers, a k, for example, normalized so the edge the number is at most one by absolute value, if you combine the Möbius function with a k, there should be some non-trivial cancellations. So this sum should be little o of capital K, where k is eventually the summation. And you expect that this will hold for any sequence every time, unless it's obviously false. And when is it obvious to false? For example, if a of k is mu of k itself, then of course you have a mu of k squared, so it's one. So you have the number of square free numbers, which is six of pi, uh, uh, six of pi squared asymptotically. Uh, okay. So this kind of very uh, general and vague statement has two sp special cases where you can formulate exact conjectures. And this is a Chola conjecture and Savnak conjecture. So the Chola conjecture says that if a of k uh, is also a Möbius function, given by a Möbius function, but with a shifted argument, you shift it by h with uh, h which is not zero and correlated with mu of k, you should get a non-trivial cancellation. And moreover, you can expect something like this when a of k is a product of several shifted values of mu shifted by different uh, legs, h1, h2, hs. Uh, and Savnak conjecture says that if a of k is given by a dynamical system, which, which is called zero entropy, I don't want to go into details, but zero entropy means that the output looks simple. So it's kind of low complexity, or sometimes people call it deterministic. Uh, there are many equivalent uh, ways to describe it without uh, kind of going into trouble giving a precise definition. Uh, uh, anyway, we stick with this very vague notion of low complexity. So in this case, you should also expect a non-trivial cancellation. Uh, I think it was about 20 years, uh, 10 years ago when Savnak proved the Chola conjecture implies Savnak conjecture, his own conjecture, and maybe this was his main motivation. So some, in some sense, Chola conjecture is, is harder, it should be, uh, but we don't have any proof of either so far. Okay, so this was what's known for Möbius, and for me it was very natural to ask whether you could formulate similar things for Klosterman and Salia sums. How do they behave if you correlate them with uh, some other sequences? Now, there are some clear distinctions. We now have three parameters instead of one, as is with the Möbius function. And the second uh, question to ask even before we try to formulate any conjectures is, what is the trivial bound? What is a non-trivial correlation? Now it's not so clear uh, because for the Möbius function, the absolute value is one or zero. 
Here it's more complicated. Uh, but at least we know that uh, these sums are bounded by the more or less square root of Q. And this consequences of the famous uh, result of Andrew Royal. So we have this, but still there is something which we need to control better if you want to formulate a very precise conjecture. There is some mysterious little O1 in the exponent, and there is a GCD, which sometimes is one, sometimes is not. So this will give us some extra trouble. But we'll talk about this in a second. And before I enter into more technical details, I want to recall this uh, very well-known definition. We say that A is less less than B, or B is greater greater than A, if uh, A is just big O of B. So all these definitions are equivalent to each other. Okay. So let's just forget about proofs and see what we really want to see. So let's formulate the conjectures which we hope to be true in the ideal world. So you can consider several different scenarios. Uh, and um, here, instead of little o or whatever would be a trivial bound, I have to be more specific due to the slight vagueness uh, in the uh, upper bound on Klosterman and Scarsalia sums. But let me try still to formulate something meaningful. So we assume that I have sequences a sub q indexed by the modulus, b of n, a sequence indexed by the, one of the coefficients in Klosterman sums, and c which depends on both q and n. So the three different types of sequences. Now, uh, what usually people call horizontal scenario, in this case it will be horizontal to the randomness, it's when we fix m and n, the coefficients in my sums, and we sum over the modulus. So as I conjecture uh, that if sequence AQ is reasonable, then the sum of Klosterman sums correlated with any reasonable sequence AQ over Q up to capital Q should give us a non-trivial cancellation. And what is it would be a trivial cancellation? You have Q values. Each of them is about square root of Q. So ignoring the GCD and other technicalities, it would be capital Q to three halves. But I assume it's less uh, that the exponent is three halves minus eta for some positive eta. So this is when we sum over all q's. Now I can switch the rules and consider what is called a vertical uh, 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 pseudo randomness, where q is fixed, but we vary one of the coefficients, just the coefficient n in this case. And also assume that in this case there should be a non trivial consolation between the sums. And finally, I can do both. I can vary both q and n. So in this, I use my sequence CQN. And again, I assume the same, the same that there should be some non-trivial consolation. And when do I make these conjectures? I make, this, uh, I make these three conjectures uh, in the case unless they obviously false. Again, it's certainly a very vague statement, but uh, I'm not claiming any proofs either. So I believe that these things should hold unless it's clear that then they do not hold. Okay, that, but this is just, as I said, in the dream world. So let's see what we can do. And let's talk about this in a second. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, we have three parameters. On the previous slide, I was averaging over, only over n. Of course, you can ask what happens if you average over m. It's a very uh, valid question. And indeed, you can also consider this scenario when you sum over everything you can see here, over all three parameters, q, m, and n. And perhaps you should expect the same behavior. And in fact, it's very possible that eta could be taken to be any number less than one half. So perhaps it's true. Uh, and just one more uh, small comment, that even if your sequences are as simple as you can think of, namely they're all constants, they equal one, these questions are still non-trivial, uh, they're interesting and they're useful. Uh, and uh, it's probably well known to everyone that questions of this type, when you sum, you can see the sums of Klosterman sums are known as Klostermania. I think this term was introduced by Huxley and then kind of uh, promoted by Henrik Ivanich. 
Igor, sorry for interrupting. There is yes. a question from Jean-Marc Gazouye. Jean-Marc, would you please mm -hmm. unmute and um, ask directly? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the meaning of the eta over q when q is fixed? Eta over q, uh, sorry, uh, let me come back. Uh, well, it's a large number. Fixed in a sense, we do, when I say fixed, it means we don't vary it. It may be fixed for the wrong choice of words. Fixed means it's a very large parameter. Okay, thank you very much. You don't sum over Q, but Q is, a, Q, Q is not fixed in, in the sense it's not bounded. Okay, now that was uh, the dream world. Now let's come back to the real world and see what we can actually prove. But before I start talking about proofs, I want to introduce a little bit um, uh, of background on Klosterman sums. And first, I want to know uh, to, uh, to notice that if you change the summation of, of the variable x to minus x, then the sum remains the same, which means Klosterman sums are conjugated to themselves, and we know this, what this means, the real numbers. Uh, for Salia sums, you don't get the same sum with this trick when you replace x with minus x because of the Jacobi symbol, but you get plus minus uh, the value of the conjugated sum, which means that there are two possibilities here. It's either a real number or it's a purely imaginary number. So it's convenient to remember. So the square of the sums is always a, a real positive number, real non-negative number. We know a little bit more. We know that we can change the order of these parameters m and n. This definition is poorly symmetric. And playing with the sums a little bit more, you can even do more you can put both coefficients m and n uh, in one product and to push everything into the first coefficient. Again, it's a simple change of variables gives this. Uh, and here uh, you see that for Salia sums, if you know much more than uh, for Klosterman uh, sums, you have a essentially closed form expression. Salia sums are given by this formula and the second sum Say when Q is a prime number, contains only two terms. It contains solutions to this congruence. X squared is congruent to MN modulo Q. So for prime numbers, we have at most two values. Uh, epsilon Q is given explicitly and depends on the residue class of Q mod 4. And this formula immediately tells us that Igor, if... Igor. Yes? In Salier Sun, square root of Q missing somewhere. Uh, square root of yes, I'm very, I'm very sorry. Thank you. Yes, it's a square root of q, of course. It would be too good to be true, or maybe too bad. Square root of q plus, uh, wouldn't be here. So this expression times square root of q. Thank you. For example, if we have no solution here, then this sum is empty and the sum is zero. Okay. So I will come back to the formulas when I, when I need them. But just for your convenience, instead of putting my name and the talk number, as people usually do in the, uh, uh, at the bottom, I put definitions of the Klosterman sums and Salier sums. So they, these definitions will be always be with us. Okay, now I want to recall the terminology which I introduced, which we call horizontal scenario. It's when we fix M and N, and in this case, fix means they are bounded indeed, and we vary Q. A uh, vertical scenario where, uh, as Jean-Marc noticed, this word fixed is not probably a good choice of word, but we don't vary Q. Q is still a large integer, but we run M and N model Q over some uh, sets. And finally, we have another scenario when we can vary all parameters in our disposal. Uh, and these three scenarios, they're usually in the decreasing uh, level of difficulty, and, and so in the increasing strength of results. Uh, even if they don't imply each other, the equations are independent. So if you know everything about the first scenario and the second scenario, you still don't know what happens in the second because of the uniformity issue. So uh, the fact that they are 
of different level of difficulty uh, does mean that they kind of dependent. So let's call about with horizontals uh, randomness where we fix m and m and vary the modulus. And here I I am not sure whether I can say more than this uh, because it's more or less what we know, uh, meaning nothing, except for one very very important case when a of q is 1 over q. So we scale each sum by 1 over q and in this case uh, I am pretty sure you all know that uh, the discovery of Kuznetsov's uh, his trace formula and which extends previous results of Peterson and Selberg uh, gives us the following estimate on the sums of cluster 1 sums with coefficients 1 over q. Uh, it's easier and more, more kind of uh, useful to look at his result with q to the 1 6 as a bound of the shape q to the 1 half minus 1 third of the exponent and never mind the logarithmic factor. Uh, q to the 1 half would be a trivial bound which follows from using just the, the uh, Andrew Weil bound and he saves 1 third. And that was a huge step towards the Linux SLB conjecture saying that this sum should in fact be of this order of magnitude, q to the little o1. So we still one six short of this result. This result was uh, improved and modified using some smoothing by Dizoye and Ivanich, and they also found new applications. Uh, then there were a series of other results, for example, Sevnak and Zimmerman they obtained a uniform version of uh, the result of Kuznetsov, meaning they obtained an estimate explicit in terms of M and N, which is a very important step for many applications. Uh, people also considered uh, sums of this type when Q runs through an arithmetic progression and did a few other things, but unfortunately none of this result is close to what expected, namely a constellation of this type. So there's a very significant progress, but we are still not there where we want to be with this. Okay, now let me switch to a different scenario with vertical randomness, which means I will vary M and N, but the modulus will stay the same. I will try to avoid saying fixed. So I think the first result in this direction was the result about the signs of cluster and sums. So we remember that cluster one sums are real numbers. So the sign is, is either plus or minus one, zero occasionally, but we know zero is almost never happens. So we will ignore zeros. And if you define E of N as a sign of cluster one sum with first parameter one and the second N, and you can switch the roles of M and N and consider what happens when I run N. So all possible values between one and P minus one then uh, there is a result of Uvri, Michel, Rewa and Sharkozy, which says that uh, if you consider these products, the products of uh, signs of cluster and sums, there is a non-trivial cancellation. So trivial bound would be P, but if you have uh, S terms here in this product, you save one over two, uh, one divided by two S plus two. So there's a non-trivial saving, which of course slightly diminishes when S grows. So I think it was the first result in this direction, uh, but certainly not the last. And a little bit later, uh, a more kind of direct sums were considered. Direct in the sense they were involved cluster and sums and salia sums directly. Namely, if we consider this transformation, the Mirbus transformation, then uh, in this notation, Fouvry, Kowalski, and Michel, uh, seven years ago, proved that if T is either Kosterman sum or Salia sum, it applies to both of them. And if you have S, in some sense, independent Mirbus transformations, and then you take this product of uh, the sums T, which is either K or S, where the second argument of the sum is modified by your Mirbeus transformations, then again there is a non-trivial cancellation, and in fact the bound is quite good, there is essentially a square root cancellation 
when the length of your summation is close to the largest possible p. So that so this product is p to the s over two for the order of magnitude. So the trivial bound here would be the capital N. Instead of capital N, the bound says that the sum is at most square root of p. Again, ignoring little low in the exponent. So when n is bigger than p to the one half plus epsilon, you have a non-trivial consolation between these sums uh, with twisted second parameter and twisted by the Smirbius transformations. And of course, you need some linear independence of those, uh, uh, of those transformations. You need some conditions, but very natural necessary conditions. And as I said, it's non-trivial in this range when the sum is long enough. Well, besides correlation of Klosterman sums between themselves, people also considered uh, how Klosterman sums correlate with other functions. And here, I will consider two probably the most famous arithmetic functions, namely the Möbius function and the divisor function. So I will look at these two sums, sum m, where we twist Klosterman sums with the Möbius function, and sums uh, which are called t sub qn, where we do the same with the divisor function tau. Say for prime modulus q, the trivial bounds here would be just one here, because this is at most square root of q. For prime uh, values of q, the bound is nice and clean, two times square root of q. And the sum of Möbius will give me at most, uh, at, uh, at most, uh, okay, uh, so what did I say here? Sorry, I missed n, it's, I, I didn't scale it by n. This should be n, and this should be n log n. Sorry, my apologies. It's not one, it's capital N, and it's at most n log n. Factor n is missing. Anyway, uh, this is a trivial bound. And if you want non-trivial bound, then yes, we still have it. But you need to assume that the sum is long enough. And remember this result about the science of Klosterman sums. Then the length was... Uh, on the length of the sum, which would give us an non-trivial saving, had to be p to the one half. Here, in this result of Kowalski, Michel, and Savin, which is reasonably recent, you need to run n up to p to the three quarters for the Möbius, n up to p to the two thirds for the divisor function. But in either case, you have a non-trivial uh, cancellation, and you have a you know, power saving. The first sum is not n which I mistakenly wrote as 1, but n to the 1 minus eta, and the same thing applies to the second sum for some positive constant eta. And I believe that if they, they didn't specify the dependence of eta on epsilon, but I believe if you go through the argument, uh, you should take you should be able to take eta as some absolute constant c, fully explicit times epsilon squared. So I don't think it was done there, but it, it's probably what we, the argument gives. And let me just stress that in these ranges, you have a power saving. Uh, if you agree to sacrifice on the power saving uh, and just want a non-trivial bound, then you can reduce the range of your sums and from three quarters and two thirds on the exponent, you can, be, uh, you can consider ranges of this order of magnitude, p to the one half plus epsilon. And, okay, here I corrected one typo, it's n, but I still didn't correct the second typo, it should be n log n. Sorry. So, uh, instead of these trivial bounds, uh, um, Mikhail Korolev and I, we proved that you have some logarithmic saving, but the range now is n to the uh, p to the one half. We used a different approach and different method. Even we use reduce some the, uh, some of the results of Vivier, Michel, and Savin, but we we dealt with the sums in a different way, and we obtained this non-trivial estimates in a shorter range. But as uh, I may, uh, as I as I, as I have already said, we lost the power saving. Uh, there is another 
class of moduli. Here, in the previous result, we considered prime numbers of uh, Q. This way, I used P. Uh, in a slightly different case, when your modulus is a prime power of a small prime, for example, a power of 2, then you can com consider very short sums. And this is a result of uh, QLU, uh, Tiaping Chunk, and myself, where we prove that when Q is a power of a fixed prime P, then you have a non trivial power saving for very short sums of this type. Namely, when n is bigger than q to the epsilon, then you already have a non trivial power saving in the sums. And, well, I present it as a theorem here, but let me add perhaps and let me explain why. Uh, it has never been written, but what we did, we considered sums over primes. So with sums where the second argument in Klosterman sums runs over prime numbers. And usually sums of this type are harder. So because for this sums we got a similar result, I'm pretty sure the same method should work for Mobius function. We just didn't think about this at that time. So I'm quite sure that what I said here is, is correct and follows from our argument. Uh, you can consider for, uh, uh, different variations of this scenario and consider different sums. For example, you can twist Klosterman sums with a digital function and consider sums of Klosterman sums where, uh, say, one of the arguments runs as a set of integers with some restrictions on the binary digits. For example, uh, you can run uh, n, one of the coefficients, over the set of integers which have exactly s non-zero binary digits. So this is the cardinality of the set. And here again, in the same paper with Karelov, we proved the following, that if S, the number of non-zero digits, uh, is greater than R, the bit length of your integer, the, number, the total number of, of digits, times z, uh, 0 0.11, a little bit more than this, which is defined by some, some equation. Then you already have a non-trivial consolation. So this parameter rho zero is the density of non-zero digits. So if the density is bigger than uh, 0 0.11 and a little bit more than this, then you have a non-trivial consolation in the sum. Now, uh, well, my initial goal was to consider Klosterman sums twisted by arbitrary sequences. And indeed, this is something I want to discuss now. Uh, and before I go into this, let me notice that if I stupidly try to deal with sums of this type, because we have two parameters m and n, and I want to twist it with gamma m and n, then of course I have no chance, because I just take gamma m and n to be a Klosterman sum. So no general result of this type with an arbitrary sequence as gamma is possible, because I will get a square. So I need to say at least something about the sequence. And this something can be uh, kind of expressed in several different types. Namely, uh, we can, and actually for many applications we should, consider these three different types of sums. Uh, we can consider smooth sums, where just gamma mn is one. The sums are still very interesting and non-trivial. We can consider sums where gamma mn depends only on the first variable m, and sums of this type are traditionally called type 1 sums, or we can consider sums where gamma splits into a product of two sequences, alpha m and beta n, and these sums are called type 2 sums. And uh, we can consider the cases when the norms of the sequences are bounded, but today, for simplicity, I will always assume that uh, alphas and betas are at most one by absolute value. So they're just individually bounded, not rather than on average. And here there is a list, and I'm pretty sure an incomplete list, of various applications of bounds and sums of this type. And uh, it's probably the most impressive application is an application to the moments of L functions. It was uh, obtained in a series of works of Blomov, Fauri, Kowalski, Michel, and Milosevic during these years. Then I did something in 2017. Uh, then 
and the first two applications used cost women sums, then Ilya Shkvedov, Alexander Zaharesko and I did uh, uh, something with Salia sums and also found applications to moments of slightly different L functions. Uh, there are some more arithmetic applications to the divisor uh, function in arithmetic progression. And again, here you can see several results. And uh, very recently, uh, Bryce Kerr, uh, Hei Ping Wu, and Ping He started work, working on, on this together. And we have uh, hopefully something which will come, uh, come out soon. Also, an application of sums of Klosterman sums to arithmetic progressions. And uh, the sums which you saw in the previous case were also a part of the method which Kowalski, Michel, and Savin, and then Kvalov and I used when we considered Klosterman sums twisted by arithmetic functions. So, uh, the, and I'm, I'm sure it's not a complete list of applications, there are many more. So, the sums are important and interesting. And when we deal with sums of this type, there are usually two kind of related but still independent goals. Uh, in, one, in some scenarios, you want to have the strongest possible bound in what's called Polyavinagrada French, namely when M and N are of this size, Q to the one half, because usually this is when things become hard. When M and N are bigger than square root of Q, some more elementary methods should work. It's still a very important range, but I uh, usually can handle it with more elementary methods. Uh, when M and N drop be below this level, things become harder. Uh, so this is one kind of goal you can you, you can you can put yourself to bet to get the best possible bound for M and N of this order of magnitude, and it's very important for some applications. But for some other applications, it's not the strength of your bound as such; it's the range in which you have a non-trivial bound bec become more important. So you want a non-trivial bound on this. Uh, some which you saw on the two slides ago, but you wanted in a huge range of parameters M and N, the parameters which control the averaging of Klosterman sums. So let's talk about the poly Vinagrada French first. And uh, I think the first breakthrough here was in the paper of Blomov, Uri, Kowalski, Michel, and Milosevic in 2014 who proves that uh, if a product of M and N is less than P to the three halves and M is less equal than N squared. So this condition is certainly satisfied if you're really interested only in this range. So it's not a restriction. And you're also usually interested in the case when M is of the same order of magnitude as N. So these conditions are very easy uh, to set, uh, conditions to satisfy. Uh, then for the type 1 sums, you have this bound. And you can easily check that uh, in the poly Vinagrada French, when M and N are P to the 1 half, then this bound saves P to the 1 over 24 against the trivial bound. And the trivial bound would be the number of terms, which is M times N times square root of P. So this is the trivial bound. Uh, so they save this in the case when M and N is exactly in the range where things become hard. Uh, a few years later, I used a different approach and proved and generalized the bound to arbitrary moduli. And the bound which I obtained it using a very different approach, a kind of more elementary approach, uh, looks like this. And this bound saves uh, q to the 1 16. So here q could be any integer number, not necessarily prime. And this improves 1 over 24 down to, uh, so not down, it's up to 1 over 16 compared to the result. And generally, uh, this uh, two bounds which I presented, they're not the only bounds. There are some other bounds obtained by different uh, uh, authors in different contexts. So if you compare all previous bounds, which I didn't list here, I presented only two kind of most, uh, most recent bounds, then this bound uh, wins all previous bounds in this polygon, uh, which is explicitly defined by this list of uh, vertices. 
Uh, but the most important part, the, the point one half, one half, which I think is somewhere here, is comfortably inside of it. So it wins in this critical point. So uh, this allows to improve some applications. Uh, and this application, as I mentioned, were two uh, moments of L functions. So what do we know about this? We consider uh, the standard Dirichlet function even if the method applies to other L functions as well, but let me start with this L function. And uh, for many years, people try to estimate higher moments of the cell functions. Uh, 10 years ago, Matthew Young uh, proved that if you take the fourth moment, namely the sum of fourth powers of all non-trivial characters, then the result is given by a polynomial of degree 4, an explicit polynomial. And the main term was known for many years. Ego, but the, yes? The notoriously ignore the normalization. I ignore the normalization, yes. It's one over p, yes. Thank you. I noticed this. Sorry. Of course, you have to normalize it by the number of, of terms, one over p at the front. Thanks, Henrik. Uh, so the uh, kind of the average value of the L functions is given by the polynomial of degree four uh, with a non-trivial power saving. Previous results would give some logarithmic saving due to his brown sound adjunct and some other people. Here it was the first result with a power saving. Uh, then Blomov, uh, Fovri, Kowalski, Michel, and Milisevich uh, improved the saving, which was made essentially one over 100 to one over 32. So the, the saving was much larger. And a few years later, uh, they uh, kind of noticed that what Tia uh, Ping Chang and I did in 2016 for smooth sums, for uh, Dirichlet L functions, you don't need type one or type two sums, you just need smooth sums. Uh, uh, using this bound allows to reduce one over 32 to one over 20. Uh, I just want to make a small comment. This result, which they used, holds for any integer q. Unfortunately, this kind of generalization to uh, arbitrary composite numbers q does not propagate to the results on moments of L functions. There are some other ingredients which should be handled, which uh, uh, before we obtain results of this type with a power saving for composite model. It's a very important question. Perhaps it's doable, but there are lots of machinery involved in this, and it will be a very non-trivial task to make sure that uh, we use the full power of this bounds on cluster one sums. And we really have results for composite Q. Okay. So before the crucial part was the strongest bound in the poly Vinogradov range, now, uh, for many applications, you need just the widest range. And here, uh, the strongest result is due to Kowalski, Michel, and Slavin, results of 2018, uh, who gave a very nice estimates on type 1 and type 2 sums. So for type 1 sums, where there is only one coefficient, the bound is non-trivial when M and N exceeds P to the 1 third. The range is slightly uh, more broad than this, but it's the most impressive kind of uh, way to present the result. So instead of one half, you can go as low as p to the one third here. And for type two sums, you have to sacrifice a little bit and one third becomes three eighths. Uh, this saving eta uh, is a function of epsilon and uh, as usual in cases of this type, again, eta should be uh, of the shape c times epsilon squared. I'm pretty sure you can get it of this form. So this is what we know in this case. Now, till now I was talking about Klosterman sums. Now let me t tell you a few words about Salia sums. Uh, and uh, in fact, some of the bounds and most of the bounds hold for Salia sums. Salia sums are usually easy, as I said, but surprisingly not enough, not all of them. For example, this approach of Kowalski, Michel, and Simon, I believe, does not extend to Salia sums. Uh, 
So we have some direct analogs of most of the results, but not of all results. On the other hand, salia sums are typically easier to handle, so very often we can do more and better, even if we have to change the tools we apply. So now I will talk a little bit about salia sums. And I start with type 2 sums for salia sums, because uh, we don't uh, take much advantage of considering type 1 sums for salia sums. It's not quite true. We have a better bound in some cases for type 1 sums, but I don't want to talk about this now. So let's consider type 2 sums of Salia sums, where we have two sequences of complex numbers, alpha m and beta n, and we sum over m and n and consider the sums. So using that, uh, the square of Salia sums is always a real number, and we apply Cauchy inequality, then very quickly we arrive to this uh, bound. The square of this type 2 sum can be estimated as the L2 norm of alpha, or if you assume that all absolute values of alpha m's are at most 1, you can put square root of uh, m here, and uh, in, uh, L infinity norm of beta is 1, if you again follow this, our, uh, our con uh, assumption. So this term is easy to understand. And then we have this sum uh, over three variables, n1, n2, outside, and the variable m inside. And here you have correlation between two values of Salia sums. So you correlate values of a n1 and a n2, and you average it over all m in this range. And then you also average over n1 and 2. So there's a triple sum, which I will denote by this symbol. And from now on, we concentrate on the sums. So sums of uh, salia sums in this form. Now these sums uh, were introduced by Dan and Zachary School in 2019, and they use them in the study of moments of some L functions, L functions for automorphic forms of half integral weight. Uh, something which the previous technology, with Klosterman sums, uh, wouldn't be able to handle. So the moment they consider we are not covered by the approach of Bloma, Fouvry, uh, Kowalski, Michel, and Milisevich. So what they proved? They proved this bound, which I strongly encourage you not to look carefully at. Uh, nevertheless, you can tr take my word on this, that in some ranges this bound is non-trivial, even if it's not completely obvious, and certainly uh, you don't want to verify it. You better t trust me that it's non-trivial, even if it's not pleasantly looking. Uh, then this result was improved and improved in a series of two uh, papers. One was uh, again by Dan and Zaharesko, and, uh, to which uh, Bryce Kerr, my uh, ex PhD student, and I joined. And uh, later with uh, Bryce Kerr, credit of Zaharesko and myself, we, approved, we obtained it another bound, and here is a summary of both results. Again, the bound may be, look a little bit more pleasant than the bound in the previous uh, case, but it's probably not much fun to verify when it's non-trivial. But uh, if you consider this special case, when both variables are less than p to the one-third, so they are very small ran ranges, then uh, in the second bound, you can see that uh, only the first term matters in each of the expressions. These terms are smaller than the second ones, uh, because the influence of P is bigger than the influence of M, and here is bigger than the influence of N. So in this range, the bound becomes of this form. It becomes MN squared, and this is number of terms. So this is times P, and the trivial bound on this is p, so this is a trivial bound, and second, we have p divided by m squared n squared to the power of one quarter. But never mind the power, you see that the bound is non-trivial when this is less than one. And this is less than, than one than when mn is bigger than p to the one half. So this means you have a non-trivial bound starting with uh, the case when both variables are of order p to the one quarter, which of course is a much below uh, the 
Polya Vinagreda fringe, where both variables of order p to the one half. Now, I, just a few words about the ideas behind the proof, because the equation we had to consider is of it's a very nice equation of independent interest. So we needed to estimate what one would call the energy of square roots. Namely, we want to estimate the number of solutions of this equation in four variables. We have variables u, v, x, and y, which run over fp each. But we impose that their squares belong this interval, and in com a very short interval of length capital K. And the equation is very simple. It u minus v is equal x minus y. So if you ignore that the square roots are not uniquely defined, you can just write it like this. You are interested in variables which you call capital U, capital V, and so on from this interval, such that the square roots satisfy this linear equation. Which, of course, is not com com completely correct because square roots are not uniquely defined, but yeah, you understand what this all means. What, and this what way is we the call interval it. of a finite field? Uh, sorry, yeah, if you, if you take square roots of a finite field, yes. Yeah, but so what, you the, take, what's, the, what's the meaning of it? Uh, we consider quadratic residues in this interval. I think you mean k, k is much smaller than p. K is much smaller than p, yes, yes, k is much smaller than p. Yes, still, but we have to yeah, take yeah, the yeah, representatives yeah. of the field. Yes, k, k, this way I say it's kind of informal definition of what we do. This okay. is a kind of formal thing which we estimate but you can think about this as equation in square roots okay even if probably it's not a good idea to put it in a paper uh, so and what we want we want to improve the trivial bound which is k cubed and of course equations of this type are of independent interest i think it's a very nice uh, equation to consider uh, what we managed to prove here uh, we proved that E of K doesn't exceed, uh, and you have a choice of two bounds. The first bound is K to the fourth over P plus K to the five halves. And in this bound, the first term is correct. So if you take uh, four random variables, then the probability that this satisfies this relation, each, each of them takes capital K values, will be this. The second term, well, it's non-trivial, it's less than k to the three, three. but uh, it doesn't kind of goes down to what would you expect, namely the diagonal behavior. The second bound, uh, in the second bound, you uh, have a wrong, in some sense, main term, so you don't have this randomness in the uh, first term, but the second term, gives you what you would expect, namely the diagonal behavior. So probably the truth is k to the fourth over p plus k squared, which unfortunately we still don't have. Anyway, we have this non-trivial bound, and uh, we can use this bound to uh, estimate by linear sums with modular, uh, with modular square roots, and one of the applications of these bounds, the bounds of the sums which you considered before, would be to the distribution of modular roots of primes. And our application tells us the following. Again, it's the same paper with Bryce Carey, Liash, Kredov, Alexander, Zaharescu, and myself. So let's fix some epsilon and assume that for an integer capital L in this range, and this range follows from our bound. But we also need to make an assumption that there are z many prime quadratic residues, L to the 1 plus little over 1. We certainly expect that it will be 1 half of L over log L. Uh, and under the Riemann uh, hypothesis, under the generalized Riemann hypothesis, we certainly have it. But uh, unconditionally, we have to make an assumption, assumption of the abundance of prime quadratic residues. So in this case, the discrepancy of this set, x over p, where x runs over all solutions to this congruence for primes L up to capital L, the discrepancy tends to zero. So the sequence of fractions is uniformly distributed. Well, as I already said, this condition holds under the 
uh, generalize Riemann hypothesis, and we also can show that it holds for almost all primes. And it's this uh, constant 13 20 over 22 is a slight improvement of 13 over 20, which we had in our previous work. Okay, I think my time is almost up, so I want to briefly mention some questions. Uh, just, just give me two minutes to go over them rather quickly, because I won't be able to say much anyway. Uh, well, for many years I was trying to be uh, to say something which would not be completely trivial about sums of this type. You take a Klosterman sum and yet another Klosterman sum with a shifted modulus and you correlate them. And I wanted to have a non-trivial bound for the sum. So to show that it's big O of Q to the 2 minus eta for some constant eta. Unfortunately, I see no way that we, nowadays we can say anything in this direction. Uh, perhaps a slight easier equation, but still very hard, is to just take different set of coefficients, not to change the modulus. When you change the modulus, you lose a lot of kind of power uh, and a lot of tools which you had before. Still, the equation is very difficult. Uh, of course, you need some non-triviality conditions, so h should be non-zero here, and here kl should be different from mn. And uh, perhaps you should even expect this bound with any eta less than one half. But again, it's just just a conjecture. Uh, please note that this condition is not enough. Because as I said, you can always move coefficients in any way you like and put both of them in the first component. So you really need this, this, pro this products to be different rather than these two pairs to be different. And of course, this, this question, the first question, is shifted model I can be extended and you can ask an even harder question, which is similar to the Chola conjecture and probably uh, is as hard or maybe even harder. Now, when we have these hard conjectures, it's natural to try to check them numerically. <clears throat> Unfortunately, even this is not so easy. Uh, because of what people call twisted multiplicativity, you can reduce calculations of clusterman sums modulo Q to calculation of uh, clusterman sums modulo prime divisors of Q. But all simplifications stop at this level. When you come to clusterman sums modulo P, we have no non-trivial algorithm to compute clusterman sums. There is an obvious symmetry, but Ignoring the symmetry, basically you have to compute the sum of p complex numbers. So to compute it without losing the precision uh, is difficult, and of course you look at large values of p. So computationally it looks a very difficult task, uh, and I don't see any kind of natural way to do it uh, in a better way than just a trivial algorithm. Uh, function field analogs. Typically, function field, field analogs uh, are considered to be easier because we have the GRH thanks to Andrew Weil. However, in the case of, and I see another uh, type, in the case of function fields, sorry, uh, this case kind of uh, lags behind the num num number case. And it does it in both aspects. Even for bounds of bilinear sums, uh, we have no bounds on type 2 sums, and type 1 sums are estimated in a much weaker way. So ma many of the tools which exist over the integers somehow vaporize when you move to function fields, and we don't have any substitutes for them. So you lose a lot of tools. Usually it's the other way around. In this case, uh, the number case wins. So they lose in this aspect. And the second aspect is also kind of not known. We don't know how to link the sums to um, moments of L functions. This link is also missing. Assume we have perfect bounds here. We still don't know how to deal with uh, function field analogs for, uh, for L functions defined over, uh, say, a rational, uh, a rational function field over FQ. There are some results in this direction, but they all give a logarithmic saving because they don't establish any link to Klosterman sums. And of course, uh, you can consider higher correlations of Salier sums, which is also interesting. 
and it's probably not so much interesting as a question in its own right, but I like this question because it immediately leads you to this equation, to the generalization of additive energy. Uh, we consider this equation with four variables, but to say something non-trivial for these sums, you need to deal with the, with the equation of this type with two k variables, where k is the number of sums you multiply here. And what you want here, you want the bound of this type, say capital K to 2K over P, which which kind of reflects the random structure of, squ of square roots in finite fields, plus K to the 2K minus three halves. This comes for free from previous results. So this is not interesting. So you need, want to subtract something from these three halves, take an advantage that you have now more variables, say six, eight or more times p to the little over one. So I would be very interested to see a bound of this type. Unfortunately, previous tools do not directly apply to equations of this type. And I think this is the last slide. Thank you very much. And I am done for today.